I'm Marissa Siegel. I am the editor in chief of The Rumpus. Um, I am quarantining here in my house in Westchester, just a little north of New York City, where it's uh, been quite eventful. And um, I'm happy to have a safe place to hang out um, and not get anything done. So uh, that's me. And then we have uh, T. Kira Madden. Um, who is an APIA writer, photographer, and amateur magician. Still haven't gotten her to show me a magic trick, but one day. Um, and she is the author of Long Live the Tribe of Fatherless Girls, just released in paperback with a snazzy new cover. Am I holding it upside down? No, I'm not. Um, and we have Chelsea Beaker, who are, we are here to celebrate tonight. Uh, and her glittery new book, Godshot, uh, which is my favorite debut novel of the year, for sure, and possibly of like the last few years, um, off the top of my head. Chelsea uh, is the author of Godshot and the forthcoming short story collection, which I'm gonna try to get her to talk a little bit about, called Cowboys and Angels. Her writing has been published in Grant and McSweeney's Electric Literature and others. Her work has been supported by the Ronan Jaffe Foundation and the McDowell Colony. And uh, originally from the California Central Valley, she now lives in Portland, Oregon with her husband and two children where she teaches. So that's who we are. Um, and basically we're just gonna chat about the book uh, and maybe a little bit about T. Kira's book also um, because I see some pretty clear connections between the two um, that I hope we can talk about. And then uh, about 10 minutes from the end, I'm gonna start reading your questions. So. Do, do send them in through the Q&A function. Um, please make sure there are questions and not just comments, because uh, I'm not gonna read your comments, but I would love to share your questions. Um, okay, so to kick us off, I thought we could talk a little, so you guys know each other pretty well. You're very good friends. Um, and Tikira, your book came out last year uh, kind of with a lot of buzz ahead of its release and a lot of well-deserved accolades upon its release. And Chelsea, your novel also um, had a lot of buzz pre-release and um, has come out to a lot of accolades. I just saw uh, it was featured again in the New York Times, which is awesome. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you went to Tikira for any tips on how to manage this debut uh, title wave. Uh, of stuff, and I realize obviously the situation is a little different for you this year, um, but still, I just kind of wondered if Tikira had any tips to share with you about about what to do when your book is kind of blowing up all over and uh, everyone's loving it, and how you navigate that. Yeah, I love this question because I I really think it points to how special friendships are between writers and going through these things around the same time is really comforting knowing that Kira was kind of ahead of me and had experienced a lot of the same things. So I'm sure she could tell you that I've texted her a thousand times through everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, Kira is just one of the most comforting people and also someone who I feel is always really honest with me. So I'm trying to think of specific tips. Um, I think mainly, the vibe of a lot of our conver conversations back and forth about writing are more connected to the actual writing. Um, we might have some anxiety back and forth about um, the things surrounding it, but I think Kira does this amazing thing where she always brings me back to what actually matters, which is the art and the actual act of writing, which is always to me the most important thing and and she's really good at reminding me of that and um i don't know kara what what else can you add to that maybe um, you have something else <laughs> yeah chelsea and i have joked that we're we're soul sisters because we've been through pretty similar experiences in our lives and i think because of that we've we've found the same uh solace and bum and the same kind of family of writers and books and not just I don't mean that in terms of just present day writers but like in our own canon of like lost children's books and coming of age stories and so we bonded when we met years ago over those books and those stories and how we wanted to write those books and those stories and even though my book came out before Chelsea's I, I want to make it clear that I feel like Chelsea is so ahead of me in so many ways too. And I text her just as much and we talk just as much about how 
for example, Chelsea has gone through the novel process and the writing process, which is something I have not been able to really successfully do yet, even though I've tried and tried and tried. Um, when I met Chelsea at the McDowell Colony many years ago, she was reading from Godshot from a different point of view than Lacey May's point of view, which is what we have in the finished product. So I've always been interested in how Chelsea, who is the hardest worker, I think I know in her craft, um, could write an entire story and then try again from a different point of view and then try again from a different point of telling. And she's just such an incredible reviser, uh, just, I don't know. Do you guys share writing and give each other feedback? We do. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I love sending um, work to Kira. I, I like to send you nonfiction a lot of the time. I feel like that kind of interaction feels really oh, good to me. Where, oh, you can't? Oh, no, I Hello? can't. Hello? Sorry. Yes. I, I wonder if the headphones are making things weird. Um, I just said that I like to send you nonfiction um, because I think we have shared a lot of the same experiences. And so having your feedback in that way feels like really comforting. I, I just find the difference between writing nonfiction and fiction so different energetically. I don't know if you feel that where I feel like writing fiction is so energizing for me. And then my experience writing essays or nonfiction or my like attempt attempt at a memoir have felt really draining and not necessarily in a bad way, but it's not energizing. Like I, I want someone there with me in that experience in a different way where fiction, sometimes I want to be more alone in that experience, if that makes sense. I'm trying to think of a way to gracefully make it seem like I did this on purpose, but I haven't thought of one. So I completely forgot that we were starting with Chelsea reading from Godshot. Um, so <laughs> first time doing this, but I'm going to just walk us back a few minutes. And Chelsea, can you read a little bit for us from the novel? And I guess that's kind of, and then we'll get into a little bit more about the story itself and, and the, the world building of, of the book. Sure. I was kind of excited. I thought maybe you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I did. Well, I did. And then uh, at some point someone said the word remember or remind and I was like, oh. <laughs> <I did. laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Well, first, I just want to say thank you to everyone being here, especially Kira and Marissa. And thank you to Books Are Magic for having me. I was so excited for this event and the fact that we can still do it in some way feels really special. So thank you all for making this happen. And we'll do it in person one day. I know. I know we will. All right. I'm going to read a little bit from chapter one. And this is right after the moment that um, Lacey May's mother, they're both in the bathroom together, and her mother has just discovered that she started her period, that Lacey started her period. So this is Lacey's first period and it's a big deal in the book. So this is kind of following that moment. I felt a surge of new self tingle within me. I didn't like my mother. I didn't like the way my mother's face flickered when she saw my first blood. I could read her so well. I could tell something troubled her, but it seemed selfish of her when now I was finally a woman. Surely the rebaptism had sparked this flow and I smiled with that warm believer's glow of confidence that came from answered prayers. I primed my eyes toward destiny. I would have an assignment and Pastor Vern would bring the rain at the right time and the town trusted him and loved him and all God's people would be tended and the crops would persevere, amen. I pulled the camisole over my head, kicked off the bloody boy unders and stepped into the shower. Can I, I asked her, hand hovering over the faucet. She shrugged in a way I knew to mean yes. The water rained brown on my skin, almost like blood, I thought, as it streamed down my thighs, wasted its way down the drain. Then clear and clean, the smell of metal, hard water, everyone called it. My mother liked to complain it made our hair dull, but what could dull me now? I was electric. I was thinking in glitter and gold, thinking with my hands raised in praise right there in the shower, of Vern's original miracle, the way he'd cured the town of drought years before when I was just seven years old. His dying daddy had ushered him in as a replacement, the new pastor of Gifts of the Spirit Church. 
Byrne had confused everyone at first with his proclamations of the supernatural and foresight, his golden robes and long blonde hair curled in ringlets sprayed to a starch. No one in town had seen him in over 10 years. He'd been on mission trips around the world, it was said, casting God into the hearts of infidels. The top of his head was shaved clean in what he called a spirit hole so that God could reach him without hair in the way. I'll bring the rain, he told everyone on his first day. And even though Peaches was in desperation time, several farmers, including my own grandpa Jackie, had killed themselves over the shame of their barren crops, drank bottles of pesticide and lay down for the long sleep. And even though there were threats to turn off the water for good and condemn the whole place to death, the doubters in the congregation had gawked at Vern with little faith, for they did not yet know the most important thing about working the land. And that was that the land was not theirs to work, but God's. Of the herd women, only my grandma Cherry attended church at that time, grasping at faith after the death of Grandpa Jackie. She had stood in the fields to see Vern command God's attention. He had knelt in the dry burrs and thrown up his hands. Cherry had seen the clean sky turn back like a page, gray eating blue, rolling into a great thunderclap. She felt the first drops on her hot skin, and then it was crashing rain for days. When it flooded the streets, when the old Peaches Canal overflowed, when the news reported the rain had only fallen in the bounds of our little county, population 1008, barely 3.2 square miles in size, there was no avoiding the truth. Byrne had shown our town what God could do. He'd summoned something from nothing, and no one was the same after that. The next Sunday, rain still falling, my mother and I had lined up with everyone else to touch the new pastor's robes, to listen to that magical voice that had brought the rains. And who was my mother then? She was a day late and a dollar short, a water bottle of gin in her purse in the glove box, a waitressing job at the grape tray, and one lousy boyfriend after another who sat pot-pellied and spread-legged in our kitchen, yellowed fingers ashing cigarettes into empty chili cans. And me? I was only her bastard daughter, unsaved and seven years old, daddyless and dirt need, whole mind a sin plane, my fingers pocketing gumdrops from the candy store, eyes watching cartoons of coyotes dropping anvils on heads, someone I can hardly remember. But thank the good God I learned that day, the past was of no matter. The rain soaked my sundress and Vern blessed us out of that life and into another. I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, you know, it's interesting hearing you. I, when I read that, I obviously hadn't read the rest of the book yet, but now hearing you read it and having read the whole book, it really sets the scene and kind of tone for everything that's going to come afterward, uh, which is impressive because a lot of things come after that. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and speaking of setting, so, so something um, that I think really connects both of your books. And I'm not just saying this because Tikira and I did a panel on setting and crafting place, I promise. Um, but really, so in in Godshot, um, Central Valley of California is, uh, we talked a little about this in our book club chat last week, almost a character in and of itself. And in uh, Long Live the Tribe, um, Florida is also a very present character on the page while the story is unfolding. And so um, I'm just wondering if you could each speak a little bit about about the craft of how you how you do that, or is it unintentional? Does it just sort of come out for you in your writing, or you know, because these are landscapes that are so personal and intimate for each of you? Um, okay, I'll start. I think when you were talking, I was thinking about the idea of it being unintentional. And I think for me, the Central Valley, having grown up there, there's something about the way that place looks and smells and actually feels in my body that I can't ever let go of. And so in writing it, it's like, I was actually there for an extended time last year thinking um, that it would really help me I don't know, conjure different images or it would remind me of something. And I realized once I was physically there that I didn't need any reminders that that the feeling of that place would always just be there. Um, I can really conjure it so quickly. And 
And so, yeah, I think, I don't know if, if it's the same for you, Kira, but I feel like when I write, it almost comes out of the bodily experience of having lived in that place and um, bringing that to the page feels like it's going to happen no matter what. Like there's no separating it really for me. Yeah. Um, I found myself when I started writing too directly about place and describing Boca Raton, Florida and describing Florida, I found myself, I had to make myself turn away because a place like Boca Raton, and I think for, for many of us, I think writing about home, it can become too, it can almost become a gimmick, especially Boca is such a place of contradiction, is such a place of high volume character um, and obscenity. And so I would, I would try to look away, but it does come through, I would say, you hit the nail on the head with, with the body, with the bodily experience of just being in this place and the nearness to both the natural world and the people um, who inhabit my hometown. Um, so for example, just through, through the lens of a young character experiencing, experiencing racism in this space, it builds the space through the narrator going to a shopping mall um, and it being 100 degrees outside in the winter and then feeling the suck of air conditioning, like the basic things we have to do to build scene, I think also build, build place. So I, I did have to approach it in more of a unintentional look away kind of space so that it didn't feel too on the nose. And when I felt that I was doing that, I had to take it back. Did it feel different? So Gotshot does stay mostly in Peaches, but you're in, in Long Live the Tribe, you do move, we're in Hawaii for a little while, mm -hmm. you're in New York for a little while. Is there a difference for you in writing Boca versus writing these other places that are not your home place? I would say every place I wrote about does feel like home. Um, uh, Hawaii does feel like home to me uh, more than the other places. And then the New York, take uh, New York is in the pages too, and Florida, and they all just inhabit a different space in my body and in my life. Um, I don't think I could write about a place I don't love. And I don't think I could write about a place uh, for which I don't have really complicated feelings. Yeah. Thank you guys. So, and we just talked a lot about the body um, and the body is really present in Godshot, um, which is, you know, so the protagonist, um, for those of you who haven't read it yet, is a teenage girl. And um, when are you thinking more in your life about your body than when you're a teenage girl? Um, and so, or teenager generally. Um, in our book club chat last week, Chelsea, we talked a lot about the Ina May Gaskin um, quote that prefaces the book. And uh, I'm not going to make you read the quote, uh, but I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit again here for, for this audience about why you chose that quote and, and why, what it means for you, um, for your protagonist to sort of come into her own as it relates to her body. Yeah, the, the, so the quote is, your body is not a lemon. Um, and it's, it's kind of clipped off from this longer sentiment that that Ina May was giving. And I think the whole of Ina May, so she's this revolutionary midwife that really kind of came up in the 70s and had a place called The Farm where women would go to birth their children, kind of in a home birth style, but supported by these midwives, um, just for context. And I just loved that line. And it always stuck with me because I think I don't know. I think in the book, especially Lacey May is coming from this place where she's growing up under this idea that she's inherently flawed, that there is something wrong with her that can be made right through the church or through God or certain spiritual acts. Um, the love she's experiencing is conditional in that way. And it's also really rooted in the servitude of her body. So those two things are connected for her. and. It is, the book really is a journey of her beginning. I would say it's probably a lifelong journey for her, but it's the start of her shedding that old belief system and moving into a space of more empowerment, more education, more trust in her own bodily experience and intuition, which um, the cult that she's been raised in is telling her to turn all of that off. And and I think that in the book, that's really 
it's very extreme. These are really extreme circumstances, but I think for me too, growing up, there was a lot of that messaging. And I think for girls growing up that there's that messaging as well, that, that we have these bodies that will need to be fixed at some point. We're going to need to tend to them in a certain way. It starts really young where the idea of being sort of inherently flawed is really ground into us, I think. And, um, I found the work of Ina May Gaskin so opposite to that. Um, and it was, for me, it was one of the first times I'd really read something that was so overtly body positive for women. And it was so powerful to me. So I felt like the, I felt there was some Ina May spirit going on in the book. And I, I really like her. So. And thank you for just teaching me, for teaching me just now the proper way to pronounce her name. I actually am not, you could be right. I I'm not totally sure. Uh, I always, I hear Ina in my head, but it could be, it could be different. I feel like I'm going to call my mom after this and ask her. I think she'll know. <laughs> a feminist in the 70s, so she'll probably have a better idea than I do. Um, Tikira, uh, as you've kind of watched Godshot, um, go through its permutations and all the way to a finished book between the covers. Um, what, you know, actually, let me share something else first that I already know uh, that I realized we, so Tikira mentioned this quickly, but so, so Chelsea shared in our book club chat last week that this book was initially written from the point of view of the mother. Is that right? Okay, the mother. Um, and now it is told from the point of view of, a te of the teenage daughter. So to kind of totally different book. Um, I'm just wondering, as you, again, watch that change um, and, and the different drafts, uh, what for you has remained sort of the, the core of like the heart of the book um, as, a re as like one of its early readers? Um, well, Chelsea touched on this earlier that uh, she's actually pretty private about her fiction. So I did not see the many drafts, though I did have many conversations with her through those drafts. Um, and again, she just, she works, I don't think I know anyone who works harder um, at her craft than Chelsea. I saw her go through so many revisions through so many years. And I think she showed me once, besides the, the reading that she did when we met, from the mother's point of view, she showed me the preface once, I think, maybe twice. And until then, it wasn't until I got the, the bound copy, um, which did change a little bit from the final copy. But I think at its core, even from a different point of view, Chelsea is always interested in the dynamic between mother and daughter, um, parental loss, uh, estrangement, which is something that I find really fresh and interesting because I think in literature and in storytelling, we, we tend to think of parental loss in terms of death always. Um, and that's certainly what my book was about. But in Chelsea's case, she's really interested in estrangement. What does that death mean when the person is actually still alive and still in reach, but out of reach? And I think that is so much more complicated and, and so interesting. And so through these iterations and conversations, that thematically seemed to always be at the core, of, regardless of what was changing in the atmosphere with the cult or with the cult leader. Yeah, it feel, it's so interesting to me. So I first learned about this book actually from T. Kira at the Portland Book Festival last year. Chelsea was with T. Kira and she introduced us um, and said, you have to read this book. You're gonna love it. It's about teenage girls and cults and it's got a glittery cover and it's just right up your alley. And I think like the day I got home, I emailed Catapult and was like, can I please have this galley? I read it in like a week. It was amazing. Um, it, it, it does hit all of those notes uh, that, that I really love, but, but what you're saying is true. So yes, there's this, this is really kind of fantastical almost story going on about this cult. And um, I'm not going to give anything away about what's going on there, but um, somehow really still, yeah, the heart of the book is about this mother and daughter and, um, and this teenage girl going through these changes in her body and all of what's going on around her, plays into that, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't in any way kind of overpower uh, those core truths. Um, Chelsea, when you, what would be like the, the one thing you want readers to take away from the book when they finished reading it? 
Yeah, I don't know about the one thing. The thing I'm thinking of the most, though, I think that the loss of of a parent, like Kira was saying, that doesn't die but is still in reach, but also not in uh, in reach at the same time. The complication there, and I think I wanted the reader to end with this idea that there aren't really simple conclusions to the emotional experience of a loss like that. And I don't think there's simple conclusions to any loss actually, but um, I think growing up, I remember like, so I have experienced a similar loss from Lacey May in the book. And I remember people feeling that maybe it was comforting to me to hear that I should just be lucky that my mother wasn't around because she was such a bad person or she, she had done all these bad things. So I should be happy that, you know, that this, that I was out of her care. And, and that was sort of this weird simplification that also felt really shaming. And I think it was perhaps supposed to be a comfort, but it never was. And I think I wanted to explore in the book how, despite the actions of the mother, despite the exterior situation of her addictions and the fact that she leaves her daughter in this really pivotal moment, it doesn't really change the fact that her daughter loves her extremely deeply and always will. And, and so to me, the book is actually really about the strength of that love, despite what some people might think seems illogical or um, there's no conditions to the love. Uh, between them. And, and for me, that's what I, I kind of wanted to explore in the book. And I hope comes across because I don't think there is a simple conclusion of um, at, at all for her at the end, really. Right. Yeah. I mean, it kind of ends almost with a new beginning. So it, it almost, it doesn't end so much as it kind of just transitions into what we can imagine might happen next. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, the well, social worker tells her she's going to need a lot of therapy, which is really true. So. <laughs> the next book is just her therapy journals. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I'm. We are just a few minutes out from starting to take uh, our audience Q and A, and since someone asked this, and I was going to ask it anyway, um, so someone a- is asking if there's going to be a sequel. Uh, and I think instead of answering that question, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Cowboys and Angels, because what I learned from you last week is that it, it's not a sequel, but, but maybe we're going to get a little bit more of Beaches. Yeah, so Cowboys and Angels is, there. it's a collection of stories I was writing alongside writing this book. So for me, they are really connected and they do inhabit some of the same spaces and worlds and worldviews. Um, there are some overlapping characters, so you might see some of the characters in their earlier life before all of this happened or, um, in different spaces, or there could be reoccurring places. Um, but I wouldn't call it a sequel. Uh, there's just, it's more like they're holding hands in a way. And I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever write a sequel or not. Maybe we'll dig up that old manuscript from the mom's perspective and see what she has to say. Although, <laughs> I don't know if that's wise. I, in a way, I'm ready to move on. <laughs> Your TV series deal. Then, then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, we, we have just a couple minutes left for my question. So I'm going to ask you both to tell me uh, if you could only have three books with you while you are quarantining what three books would they be? Or if that's too hard, because I am a person who hates being put on the spot like that. uh, What are a couple books you've read in the last month while you're quarantining that have sort of helped your brain um, survive this weird new reality we're in? last time I saw you, Marissa, we were with Elizabeth McCracken on a panel, and she said, every time I'm asked that question, I only remember that I've read Lolita once. (laughs) Uh, And that's also how I feel sometimes. Uh, I just revisited Kristen Arnett's Mostly Dead Things, because uh, we looked at Mostly Dead Things for my class this week, and that 
always brings me back to to Florida, to the craftsmanship and sentences. It just brings me so much joy to read that book. And like Godshot just kind of shatters me at the same time. Like you, it circles something and then finally you see the core of what that story is and it destroys you. Um, who's also celebrating her paperback next week, which I'm excited about. Um, I am always rereading Linda Berry. Um, Cruddy is my favorite novel that I share with Chelsea. It's kind of like our soul book. And right next to me, I have The Good Times Are Killing Me, which I've been rereading this week, which is uh, gorgeous, also devastating. And my friend uh, Don Teal Monez's Milk, Blood, Heat, which is a short story mm -hmm. collection coming out, I think the end of this year, or early next year, I'm not sure, but it is astonishing. Her work is astonishing. I feel really lucky to be reading an early copy. What was the title of that? Milk, Milk. Blood, Heat. Okay, I'm gonna look that up. Yeah. Um, your judgment is almost never, or it, in my experience, never wrong when it comes to books, so. It's incredible. She's amazing. Another Florida writer as well. Lots of great Florida writers right now. Something special there. Yeah, I've heard of that book too. Maybe you'll have to throw it my way when you're done. I'm excited to read. I love the title of that. Well, um, cool. <laughs> I quarantine. Um, I really hate that word. <laughs> I'm so what an what a word. Um, I so I want to mention Boys of Alabama by Genevieve Hudson first and foremost. I don't know if have you read that one, Marissa? No, not yet. I did not get a galley of that. But I oh. Will. You, sh you need one. Um, I think it's coming out in May. Yeah, May, mid-May. It's a really beautiful book. Um, and I was kind of revisiting that. I read, an, I read different drafts of it over the, over the last year. And um, so I'm loving that one. I can't wait till it's actually out. And then I just read My Dark Vanessa. Have you read that? And I know Kira read it. I it really I know a was little so bit. good. Not read it. I loved it. I flew right through it. It's one of those books that you just are like, you cannot put it down. Um, it's very well. for me. So I tend to shy away from books that that cover that kind of subject matter just for personal reasons. But um, really difficult. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I thought the way she did it was so unexpected and, and so smart. Just on a craft level, it was really an interesting read. Um, and then I just got um, Lovers and Writers by Lily King. And I haven't started it yet, but I'm excited to start that one. Okay. I feel like I should answer this question, but I also feel like I should have had an answer ready because I knew I was going to ask the question. Um, I mean, I've been kind of widely recommending Sam Irby's new essay collection to anyone who wants to read something that will make them laugh and feel good, but it's also really wonderful writing, uh, and that's called Wow, No Thank You. Yes. Thank you. Um, and um, I am in the middle of reading Tracy O'Neill's Quotients, uh, mm. which is our next book, mm. book. And it is a little eerie to be reading right now, but, um, but it's wonderful and uh, definitely um, a novel to look out for. I think its publication date is in June. Um, and I don't know what my third one would be, but it would definitely be poetry because I haven't listed a poetry title yet. So, so something at the top of my pile that's poetry uh, would, would be coming with me in my three books also. All right, so we've got lots of questions and I apologize that I'm not gonna be able to read them all, uh, but let's start off with, with this question that I think you can probably both speak to. Um, as a, this is from Kim, and Kim would like to know, as a writer, how do you maintain distance from a story that has a lot of connection to your real life? Um, and how do you characterize to ensure that you're, that you're not just creating a protagonist that mirrors yourself, but that you're actually writing fiction? So actually, so for Takira, I mean, you're not right, you weren't writing fiction, you were writing a memoir, but, um, but sometimes I think you're, you're dabbling now in fiction, yes, so maybe you can talk a little bit about that. And, and Chelsea, you've mentioned that you and, and the protagonist of Godshot have some parallel experiences. So 
can you talk a little bit about about maintaining distance from that when you need to? You want to start, Chels? Sure. Um, yeah. So I think for me, the the things that are happening in the book uh, definitely didn't happen to me for the most part. Um, a lot was just pulled from imagination and inspiration from the place and wherever stories come from in our minds. For me, what I think was the truth though was more of the emotional experience and the feelings. So, um, you know, I think in the earlier drafts of this, I maybe even tried to avoid some of the, some of the things that were too close to the things that I had experienced. But in the end, I pulled back in the places that needed that emotional depth. And that is what came from, from me and my own experience, I think, more than anything. Um, and distance. I felt because the external events were so heightened and so wild and, and something I didn't experience. Um, I was never in a cult. I never was driving around in a magenta hearse and, you know, I wasn't bathing in Coca-Cola. Like those details helped me stay in that total fictional dream and world. Um, but yeah, it was more adhering to the emotional truth of, of the characters for me. I think, um, you know, I don't think you have to stay away from, I, I forgot the exact wording of the question, um, but stay away from yourself when you're writing fiction. Um, my, so a, a little background, my degree uh, was in fiction and that's what I wrote for almost a decade before I wrote this book accidentally. And before I wrote my memoir, I mostly wrote about characters in my fiction that were nothing like me. In grad school, I only wrote about like white straight men because I had this idea that that was the literature, those were the stories that would be taken more seriously. Um, I had the Clairvay Watkins on pandering little white man that I was pandering to in my work. And it wasn't until writing nonfiction that I realized there was so much value in just writing the people I know and the worlds that I know and the people I know. And since then in my fiction, I, I am using myself in a way that I, I had really shut myself out of that before. And now I take myself and my experiences and in my fiction, I just tend to exaggerate them. Um, and that's really fun. If I have a question I can't answer, I, I just exaggerate it like tenfold and that becomes the fiction. Um, a story of mine, which I was with Chelsea actually when I started writing it. Um, so in my life, I've met two siblings as adults who I didn't know growing up. And then I wrote a story in which somebody goes to a convention where the sperm donor is a dead corpse in the corner and there are hundreds of siblings and it's this meet and greet in Las Vegas and it's really bizarre. Um, and I love that story and I think it's because it came from this real question and real pain um, and real scene that I wanted to imagine. And so I mm -hmm. think if you give yourself more freedom to access those hot spots and those questions you do have and then explode them and see what happens rather than shutting yourself out of the equation, you might find the writing frees itself up and becomes a little more fun. Yeah, I think a lot of my writing is actually answering the questions of what would have happened if yeah. this other thing happened, you know, yeah. and that is really fun. There's so much um, area to play with that and, and it does come from those lived experiences usually. Um, oh, there are so many good questions here. Okay, Genevieve Hudson wants to know, uh, after spending years dedicated to writing one long project and immersing yourself in it, how do you begin a new project? Um, and let's take that to mean, so not the, not the story collection you were writing alongside Godshot, um, but, but whatever you're thinking of, of doing next. Um, and, and Takira, you know, when you finished Long Live the Tribe, you know, what, what were you thinking of doing next? So how do you you know, how do you get ready for what's coming next? You want to go first, Kira? And maybe sure. a fallow period? I am, um, yeah, I, I've been working on a novel for about six years, and just this winter, I finally put it on the shelf and started over again in a, a far more significant way. For the first time, I feel like it's actually a really new novel uh, with a new title and new characters, uh, totally different setting. And I've really, 
it's been fun to just start to go back to basics. I realized that my issue is overthinking things. And I think because of the memoir, I, I, there are still so many questions, of course, in the memoir and in my life, but you generally have a sense of A, B, C. This is what happens. This is what happens. This is what happens. And it repeats itself. Uh, so for the new book, I'm just starting with like basic questions and writing prompts every day about these people and what they sound like and how they act when they're colliding in scenes. And it's just been free writing every single day. And I'm doing it for, I'm on a, a strict routine for the new book where I'm just asking those questions every single day, five questions a day. Um, and just generating before I actually get to the writing, writing and just getting to know them. Are you guys both writing right now through what's going on? Are you finding it, you know, as easy to write? I am and I know many people are not and I think that's, that's very understandable. But for me, it's the only thing that's centering me right now. Um, I have to be very strict about it for my mental health to just keep to keep working every day. When I don't work, I feel really just not okay. Yeah, I've been wanting to, and my children do not want me to. <laughs> They're sabotaging me currently. Her job, I feel like. I only have, yeah. <laughs> does seem intent on, on kind of sabotaging any plan I make to get stuff done. So, I yes. Do. Um, I saw this, I was watching a YouTube video and this ad for a Joyce Carol Oates masterclass came on and she was like, the key to writing good fiction is not being interrupted. And I was like, fuck, I'll never write anything ever again. <laughs> um, and it was all about like this idea of that the imagination must never be interrupted. And I was like, well, I wrote this book with so many interruptions. And I just, maybe it would have been so much better had I not been interrupted, but um, I'm working with what I have and I'm writing a little bit, you know, I have this, this voice that I am attracted to right now. That's kind of started out like a short story. And then it just felt like I wanted to stay there. And I don't know, I'm just like open to what that project might be, but right now it feels like I want to explore it in a longer form. So I feel really excited about that. And it feels different than this book and um but definitely i'm wanting to explore motherhood in a much deeper way with whatever project i do next so i'm kind of in that space and thinking about it but trying right now i'm probably actually writing maybe twice a week it doesn't feel great but that is great we're doing what we can <laughs> All right, we're just about out of time. So I'm gonna ask one more fun question that's here um, because of the rest of them, we don't have enough time to answer um, with apologies. Uh, so both of you have books with really eye-grabbing covers. Um, Takira, you might have two really eye-grabbing covers. Um, and so uh, what was it like to see those books, like to get that first box of books at your house? Um, I don't know if anyone has seen the photo of Chelsea laying in her gold dress with her. <laughs> Her, but I think that actually speaks a lot to how it might have felt. Um, but maybe you guys can talk a little bit about what did it feel like to see your book for the first time finished. Um, I'll start because I want Chelsea to have the final word. But uh, it's just there's a there's actually a video on my Twitter that's pinned of the day I got my my finished book. I went straight to my mom's salon. She works at a hair salon, and I surprised her with a copy, and she was kind of screaming. And I mean, it's it's the it's the moment one imagines, I think, if you're, if you're a writer, if you have that part of you since you're a kid. Um, and to see glitter, which Chelsea and I both have, which was really exciting, and to see the way that it shines and this, to see for years, I said, I want a book and I would go like this. And people would say, what are you doing? I'm like, I want something I can knock on. I just want like a physical thing to hold rather than these floppy pages <laughs> for my whole life carrying around the floppy pages and binders and notebooks. Um, so that felt really nice. And I just, because you asked that, sorry, flattering angle. I have the original glitter that my amazing designer Tree Abraham gave me for my book launch. Oh, <laughs> oh my TV. God. And it's dated with my pub date and it has the original oh, that's glitter from the cover. So it stays on my desk as this 
reminder not only of that you know I have a finished product that I made but also the the gift of the collaboration that I could work with someone like Tree Abraham and someone like Bloomsbury to to make something that I feel so proud of oh I love that I remember seeing Kira's cover for the first time it was so exciting um and yeah I think seeing my own was really actually pretty emotional um and like what you just touched on where it's sort of this physical manifestation of something that's lived within you for so long. And it's also representative of all these other people that have gathered together to bring it into the world. Because obviously I didn't create this cover. I didn't format the pages. I didn't bind it together. It's like, it's this, I don't know. It's this object of love now that um, includes so many amazing people at catapult and, when I first saw the cover that Nicole Caputo designed, I, I just felt like someone had seen the book truly. Like they had seen me in this way that is pretty indescribable. And it's a really special moment. I feel really honored. I don't know. It just feels like an honor that someone would like adorn your book in its own little like wearable jacket. And it's like a little person. Yeah. And I think it's also like now it's not really mine anymore. It's, it's everyone else's and it's for the reader now. And, and so symbolically it felt like, okay, like I can let this go now. And, and now it's just in the world. It's going to have its own journey. So it's very cool. I think it's going to have a long and very successful journey that will at some point include events in the real world. Um, thank you guys both so much for spending some time chatting tonight. I have no idea how we wrap this up, so I'm going to let Books or Magic take over. Yeah. I speak for all of us. Love you, Kira. Love you.